For our sermon this morning, please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. The Gospel of Mark in chapter 7, continuing our study through this glorious book of the life of Jesus Christ heading directly toward the cross. I begin reading in verse 1, Mark 7, beginning in verse 1. Please follow along with me. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem, when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answers and said to them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well reject ye the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother." making the word of God of none effect by your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things do ye. These are the words of God. May he add his blessing to the reading of it. Many preachers have rightly said, First Baptist Church, Christ plus nothing equals everything. I like to kind of flip that around and say it a little bit more intensely. Christ plus anything equals nothing. If you add anything to the finished, sufficient work of Jesus Christ that alone can bring us to the Father, you've destroyed the gospel and the Christian faith itself. Our faith, brothers and sisters, is one of following, exalting, living, and dying for Jesus Christ on his terms and for him alone. Y'all, let me tell you something about the Bible. This book, from Genesis to Revelation, is unified in the message that it presents to us. It is all about one thing, redemption for sinners through the work of Christ. That's what this book is about. Every book is about that. And when you read the Bible, if you don't come away with that, you didn't get it. You didn't get what it was all about. I'd like to tell you this morning that the default position of sinful human beings is to reject this truth of salvation by, through, and for Jesus Christ. And if the devil cannot convince you to reject Christianity outright, if he cannot convince you to live your life as an atheist or as an agnostic or in some other religion, do you know what he will do? He will devise a way for you to think that you are honoring God whenever you're actually following the traditions of man and not the commandments of God. He'll try to come up with a way that you think you're living an authentic Christian life when in reality you've rejected it wholesale. People don't stop rebelling against God in sinful ways merely because they put on the outward veneer of religiosity. The greatest deception is for religious people to follow man-made traditions all the while thinking they're honoring God on the path to heaven. And the text before us this morning shows us how the Jewish leaders had done just that. 
They made up their own religion void of Christ. And here, first this morning, we will learn of the nature of true legalism. The nature of true legalism, which is to think that you can earn eternal life and to hold to books that are not Scripture as though they were written to God. Okay, That's real legalism. Second, we're going to look at the nature of true worship, how the Lord longs for a people to worship Him in spirit and in truth, from the heart according to the Bible. And last, thirdly, we will learn this morning about the nature of true authority. All that God demands of his creatures for faith and practice in this life is found in this book. And we deviate from it only at our own peril. Anything put in the place of Scripture or anything elevated above Scripture is going to lead us astray. So let's begin with the first of those three points. First, we'll look at the nature of true legalism, true legalism, and that is in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. The Pharisees had done what they do here before. Whenever John the Baptist was preaching at the banks of the Jordan River, the Pharisees were concerned about him, so they came down from Jerusalem and began somewhat of an inquisition against him. That's what's going on here. The Pharisees didn't like the Lord Jesus Christ, and so they come down from Jerusalem. That's somewhere around 100 miles, y'all. And they're not coming to receive a miracle. They're not coming to listen to his teaching. They're coming because they have a complaint, and they're trying to catch him red-handed and trip him up and expose him. And what is the complaint that the Pharisees have against Jesus? Your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. Are they concerned about hygiene? No. They are not concerned about that at all. The author of this gospel, Mark, is writing to a primarily Gentile audience like us. And so in verses 3 through 4, he explains to us what the complaint of the Pharisees really was. You see, the Pharisees came to the scene because they wanted to protect the Old Testament law, right? And so what they did, they came up with all of these extra rules, to fence around the law of God, right? So, so the law says you cannot be ceremonial, ceremonially unclean for the priesthood before you do sacrifices. So the Pharisees put a fence around that just so that we don't even get close to the possibility of violating the law. Let's just say no one is allowed to eat without washing their hands and having their food in a specially washed pot, right? But eventually... All of those extra traditions outnumbered the commandments themselves. And after 400 years, those extra biblical traditions became more important to the Jewish people than the commandments themselves. Can I just tell you something? I have become weary with the way modern evangelicals preach against legalism and Pharisees. Are any of y'all there with me at all? Okay. What am I talking about? It seems to me that any time somebody talks about holiness, about eternal judgment, any time somebody talks about standards God has that he actually expects us to obey, right? What are they accused of being? You're a legalist. And there's no shortage of them. Anytime a man of God stands up and says, you know what, we don't really need to supplement Scripture with all of these godless and worldly ideologies, nor do we need to subjugate Scripture to human reason or modern science. I think we can follow the Bible alone. And then they get called Pharisees for it. It's insane, y'all. And there's many people, my own peers millennial pastors. I know a lot of guys my age who go into otherwise traditional churches, and they try to change everything. So they rip out the pews and they bring in chairs. They burn the pulpit and bring in a tiny little flimsy music stand. They throw out the coat and they throw out the ties and they bring in a trendy t-shirt and 
they get rid of the hymnals, and they bring in this contemporary charismatic music, and then the inevitable thing that always happens is they get backlash. People say, hey, maybe it's not a good idea for you to destroy everything we've done for the last 200 years. And then these young pastors, I could give you some names right now, go to their congregations and say, quit being a bunch of legalists and Pharisees. That preaching makes me sick. I hate that kind of preaching. Now, y'all, there's nothing wrong with having traditions. There's nothing wrong with even loving your traditions. So long as they are pulled out of the Bible and point you back to the Bible. If your traditions do that, it's good. Let me, let me give you two examples, okay? And I'm going to just offend everybody with this. So on, on one side of the aisle, you have people kind of more like those I identify with, where we see God is holy, he should be worshipped reverently, so we put on our Sunday best. And having your Sunday best, that's a tradition, right? It's a good tradition. But if somebody walks through the doors wearing a t-shirt, and I say, you're sinning and you need to leave because you don't have a tie on, you know what I just did? I just elevated my tradition to the same level as divine command, and I'm sinning. It's wrong, right? You have to have a capital C command from God and a lowercase t tradition that is from humans, okay? okay? Let me go to the other side now. I know lots of churches that say Jesus welcomed the outcast, and he did, didn't he? Jesus welcomed the outcast, amen? And so they'll plant a church and they'll start a tradition that you come to worship services in your everyday clothes. And y'all, let me just say, I think that might be very appropriate. I think that's completely fine in many cases. But if they take that tradition of dressing casually and elevate it to a standard so that I walk in wearing my coat and tie and they say, that's not okay, you need to dress down, which believe it or not happens, they've committed the exact same error. The point is that we go to what God says and we submit our lives to that. And we have to be aware of where our traditions are taking the place of Scripture or being elevated above the place of Scripture. Look here at verses 3 and 5. You'll notice a phrase that is repeated in verse 3 and in verse 5. It's called the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders. In reality, that should be capitalized and it should be italicized, okay? Because that is an extra biblical book. At, at this time in the first century, it was all an oral tradition, but later it was written down. It was called the Mishnah, and today it's part of what's called the Jewish Talmud, okay? This is what legalism is about. You have a book that is not in the Bible that you say is from God. And then you say, you have to follow this book, otherwise you will never get to heaven, and you have to earn salvation with your own good works. So is legalism in a church where people dress nice, sing hymns about the grace of God, preach biblical sermons about how we're saved through faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone? Legalism is not necessarily found there. Here's where legalism is found. It's found in the Mormon tabernacle, where you have the Bible and you have the Book of Mormon. And they say, you can be saved by grace after you do everything you can to save yourself. Legalism is found in the Jewish synagogue, where they have an Old Testament and they have the Talmud. And they say, you are saved by doing everything you can to obey the law yourself. Legalism is found in the Islamic mosque, where they say you have the Old Testament and the Quran. And you are saved by following the five pillars of of Islam. Can legalism be in a Christian church? Yes, it can. It absolutely can. Only where the gospel is not preached. Only where the Bible is not known. But can I tell you a secret? If the gospel is not preached and the Bible is not known, that is not a church. I don't care what the sign says. It's not a church. So my question this morning for each of you is this, are you a Christian? You say, yes, I am. Okay, well, let me ask you another one. 
how do you know? How do you know that you are a Christian? Now, when I ask you that, if the first thing that you do is start to put together a list of all the good things you have done in your life, you should be very concerned right now. Jesus went to a man that the Bible calls the rich young ruler, and he says, I've kept the law from my earliest days. I've always honored my father and mother. I've never stolen anything. I've been a good boy. The same thing is said in Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus describes the day of judgment. There will be many who stand before him on that day saying, Jesus, you're my Lord. And did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name and in your name do many great works? And he responds to them, I don't know you. Depart from me, you're workers of lawlessness. If you are thinking, how do I know I'm a Christian? And you think, well, I've never killed anybody. You know, I go to church, maybe, maybe just on Easter and on Christmas, or, or maybe you come to church every single Sunday and on Sunday night, so you're a really good Christian, right? And you say, I help the poor, I, I feed the hungry, I give to missions, therefore, from all the things I've done, surely I'm going to heaven. If that is you, you are definitely going to hell. It's the truth, y'all. You do not earn salvation by your own good works. A truly saved person is asked the question, are you saved and how do you know? And then they answer something to the effect of this. In me and in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. From my youth, I have broken God's laws and I deserve damnation and perdition. I deserve it, but praise be to God. Someone has paid my fine. Someone was punished in my place. The death that I was supposed to experience was conquered by someone else when he rose from that grave and his name is Jesus Christ and he has given me his own perfect righteousness when I believe that gospel truth and I am saved now, not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done in love for me. That's how the Christian answers that question. The Pharisee stands on their unbiblical books and say, work and go to heaven. The Christian stands on scripture alone and says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Second, we look at the nature of true worship. Chapter 7, and you'll notice here in verses 6 through 7, the nature of true worship. Jesus says, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. The Greek there for hypocrites was originally meant as a a word for uh, stage actor, somebody who pretends, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with plays and actors in and of themselves, but what he's saying is, hey, Pharisees, you're just putting on a show. It's not real. You're not really worshiping God. You're just doing this uh, to convince yourself of a lie and to portray something to the people who are watching you. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles now to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, and we'll go to chapter 4. And keep your finger there in Mark because we are going to come back to it to finish up the passage, but I want to show you a cross-reference here. So Jesus quotes from Isaiah, and he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So if we don't want to worship God in vain, then what do we have to do? Don't worship him with the lips. Honor him, worship him with the heart. Don't worship him according to the traditions of men. Worship him according to the commandments of Scripture. That is exactly what Jesus says here in John chapter 4. John 4, and you'll look at verse 23. Verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit, you could say with the heart, and in truth, you could say according to divine commandments. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. What is God the Father looking for? People who worship him the right way. 
There are people all across this world saying they worship the true God, but it's not in spirit and it's not in truth. Verse 24, for God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's break that down very briefly. Number one, worshiping in the spirit. Worshiping him in the spirit. If he is worshiped here, he's worshiped with pure motives. He's worshiped from the core of your being. No pun intended, the heart, the core of your being. He's worshiped from a heart that's been transformed and genuinely wants nothing more than to love God, to know God, to obey God, to enjoy, to, and to just him, for him to have every part of your life. It's not a ritual. It's not going through religious motions. Do you know that a lot of people come to worship services like this one and they never worship? They come into the room and it's time to sing the songs and they just stand there like a rock. It's time to bow our heads and pray, but the people are either sleeping or they're letting their minds wander off to what they're going to have for lunch, right? Or what they're going to watch whenever they get home on TV. It's time for the sermon and the people either do not listen and if they are listen, they do so having absolutely no intentions of ever applying that message to their lives. But worship from the spirit, worship from the heart sings these glorious truths about the gospel while thinking about everything that it means. Worship from the heart prays while being desperate for God's grace and listens to the gospel preached from God's word, knowing that life and death hang in the balance because they do. That's what spirit worship does. And second here, worship in truth. Worship in truth. This means you worship God as he has commanded you to worship him. He's the one who's being worshiped. I think we might want to go to him and say, Lord, how do you want us to do this? How do you want us to worship you, Lord? If we don't do that, no matter how good our intentions are, everything we're doing is worthless. Okay? I, I had a professor in Bible college he pastored for a long time, and uh, somebody came up to him after the service and said, Pastor, we, we love the preaching. We, we really love you. We love everything you're doing at this church. But I got to tell you, Pastor, we don't get much out of the, the worship music here. We, we don't get much out of the songs. The pastor said, well, that's my fault. That, that's my fault. No, it's not your fault. We just told you we love you. We love your sermons. We love everything you do. He goes, no, no, I mean it. It's my fault. How is it your fault, pastor? We're saying everything you do we like. How is it your fault? He said, it's my fault because I didn't know worship was about what you got out of it. I thought worship was about what God got out of it. I thought we came here to church on his terms so that he could get glory, so that Christ could be formed in our hearts, and we leave here looking more like Jesus, not to entertain you and give you what your fleshly, carnal, sinful flesh wants. We're here for God. We are here for God. We worship him in truth. And if we don't do this... If we don't do this, we're like that church in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. The church was called Laodicea. And Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. You're just going through the motions. You think you have everything that you need, and you don't understand how desperate you are. You're not poor in spirit. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Christians who are not worshiping in spirit and in truth, I just want to say it the harshest way I know how. They make God sick. They make God sick. We would be better off getting real and just not having church at all if we're not actually going to come to God on his terms and do this the way that he wants us to worship him. But if your heart's not here, brothers and sisters, 
If you feel dry, if you feel like you're just going through the motions, it feels like dead ritual and vain tradition, can I say, don't give up. Get desperate. All of us go through this at times. I've had times when I came here and my heart wasn't here. Maybe just bow your head during the music and say, Lord, my heart's not here. Like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, would you set this heart on fire, Jesus? Would you remind me what it means to be passionate, to be zealous, to be desperate for your grace, to always want more with you and to not be content with who I was five years ago? Lord, pour out your spirit. Revive me again. Teach me how to lay down my life as a living sacrifice. Sometimes my preaching scares even my own son. (sighs) There's nothing more important for you this side of eternity than to be a genuine worshiper. Stop at nothing until you are. Amen. Amen. Lastly here, we've seen true legalism. We looked at the nature of true worship. Lastly, back in the Gospel of Mark, let's look at the nature of true authority, and then we can go from this place. Here in verse 9, Jesus begins with what is really a sarcastic statement. Mark 7, verse 9, full well you reject the commandments of God to keep your own tradition. He, he's using sarcasm right there. He's saying, you've made an art form of this. You do this all the time with all the stuff that you guys do. And he quotes Exodus 20 and 21, and it's the fifth commandment. I find it very interesting that going verse by verse through Mark landed this text on Mother's Day. He says, God commanded you to honor your father and your mother. And then he goes to Exodus 20 and he adds a stipulation to it. And if you curse your father and mother in the Old Testament, that was a death penalty. That's how serious God takes it. But the Pharisees had a tradition in the tradition of the elders, this extra biblical stuff. And they said that if you say Corbin, what does that mean? It means dedicated to God. If you say all of your money is dedicated to God, then you can not have to support your parents. Say your parents get elderly. God wants you to care for them. God wants you to care for your mama. He wants you to love them. And these people had made a way to say, actually, my money's for God. My parents can just die, I guess. That would be the same as if someone was coming to us on the streets and they said, I'm going to die next week unless I get this operation. Can you please help me pay for it? And you say, I can't help you pay for it. I got to give my tithe, right, to the church. So I guess you can just stay here on the streets. That's insane. That's an insane way to look at this. But that is what they were doing. When you exalt something over the Bible, you destroy the Bible. And this sort of thing had just permeated all of first century Judaism. How many of you remember in the Sermon on the Mount? There's six times when Christ says, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? He wasn't nullifying the Old Testament. He wasn't adding some new revelation. He was calling out these traditions of the Pharisees. The Pharisees said, you can get a divorce so long as you have the right paperwork. They said, you can lust with your eyes so long as you never cheat on your wife. You can hate somebody in your heart so long as you never actually murder them. They said, you can even tell lies so long as you're very careful with your words. And Jesus came forward and said, you've heard all that was said, but I'm telling you that was never God's original intention. If you look with lust, it's the same as adultery in your heart. If you hate somebody, it's the same as murder in your heart. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no and many other such things. He wanted inward purity, not outward perfection. And so in reality, the Pharisees' standards didn't go far enough. Right? You're trying to obey the law on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. So consider this, consider this. If God demands the outside and the inside to be completely pure by his word, 
then who can earn heaven? If the Pharisees couldn't do it, who can? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody can do it but Jesus. Only the grace of God can cleanse your heart. Without Christ, you will only be washing a pot, cleansing those hands again, but on the inside, that heart is rotting, full of bitterness, full of sin, full of lust, full of hate, dragging you down to damnation. The Apostle Paul tried to be saved by legalistic Pharisaism, and he concluded that it was better to take everything he had done in that religious works-based system and throw it aside like it was excrement if it meant he could win Christ. That's what he said. In Galatians 2, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness is come by the law, then Christ died in vain. Don't add to Christ's finished work. He's enough. He is enough. As I conclude... I'm reminded of a movie uh, from 1953. And it was a movie that was made about the life and the teachings of Martin Luther. And as many of you know, during that time period, the Roman Catholic Church had developed all of these, much like the Pharisees, rules, regulations that were not in the Bible, saying you have to keep this, you have to work, otherwise you'll never go to heaven. You have to pray to these saints. You have to pay these indulgences, offer these sacrifices and whatnot. And Luther just went back to the word, just said, no, we're saved by faith. We're saved by God's grace. And in the movie, one of Luther's mentors comes up to him and says, Luther, if you take all of these things, the prayers to the saints, the pilgrimages, all of these different things that we do, all the images, all the great works that we've accomplished, and you, and you just dismiss them as crutches. You get rid of them all. What are you going to put in their place? And in the film, Luther replies, Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the sufficiency of what we have in the gospel. If anyone here is depending upon their works to be right with you, I pray that you would show them the emptiness of those works, that they would understand that if righteousness came by good works, then you died in vain. You died and you rose so that our lives would be laid down for you and that being born again, being made into new creations, then we can bear fruit then we can produce good works that actually honor you and glorify you. On this Mother's Day, I ask that Jesus would be exalted in each of our homes. If there are mothers here who have been praying for the salvation of their children, may this be the day that those children repent and place their faith in the living Christ. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.